Division One Rejects. I'm your host, Kobe Manso. We're back for D1R 182. October 28th, two great guests join me tonight outside of the usual faces. Jimmy Martin, Matt Schwarzler back with me tonight to talk D3 and NAIA football respectively. But also joining the show tonight, how about Charles Mutter and Reed Potts? Two signal callers, quarterbacks tonight joining the show Charles Mutter under center right now for the Wasps over at Emory and Henry. They are off to an incredible start. And uh, 7-1 and one right now inside of the SAC. And we talked about them just a couple weeks ago when they took down number 6 at the time, ranked Lenore Ryan. This is the team at Emory and Henry I'm super excited about. You guys are going to be pretty surprised when you hear the story about uh, their coaching situation, where that was at in the preseason. As well as, this is the team, this is their first year of being a fully institutionally recognized Division II squad. I don't know if that was the correct way of saying that. But they were D3 all the way up until 2022 and have gone through a three-year realignment process to be fully instated into the Division 2 scene, and now it looks like they might be making a push into the D2 playoffs. So, really excited about this Wasp squad and a talk with Charles later on. And then Reed Potts, quarterback for Evangel, the Valor, an NAIA team that uh, we've talked about a good bit on this show. They were our Game of the Week selection this week. Have never had any players on down there in Missouri from the Valor. So, excited to get Reed on. He's made some D1 stops, kind of exemplifies the name of D1 Reject, um, but made some D1 stops and then came down to the NAIA level in his home state and is contributing in a big way on that Evangel squad. Otherwise, big time D2 highlights. We have some regional rankings that have kind of sort of started to drop from the NCAA that I'm excited to talk about. Five top 25 matchups from five different conferences. So much talk about the D2 scene. Had some uh, big time D3 games and of course the NAI scene with Matt to close out the episode. Thank you so much for all you tuning in. Make sure to watch this episode on YouTube. Don't forget the timestamps, video chapters, bottom of the screen. Fast forward to any part of of the episode you'd like to catch. Otherwise, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, catch us wherever. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let's get to that first conversation with Charles. Join the show tonight, leading the charge for an Emory and Henry team that is 7-1 for the first time in a decade. That feels pretty important. Coming off a massive win over top 25, Carson Newman, where ranked teams go to die. It's quarterback, Charles Martin III. What's going on, man? I'm good. How are you doing? Dude. I'm good. I'm excited to get you on here. You and I were chatting before, and and you had mentioned, you know, obviously for you guys, the first time at this level, at least, to be in kind of this national media scene, I'm glad to be the one to hopefully welcome you, and hopefully I'm the first of many interviews for you down the road, my friend. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you about uh, the Wasp, man. You guys, you took on a monster in the SAC just a few weeks back, Lenore Ryan, and for me, that game puts you guys on my map, and, uh, you know, admittedly, you were not on that map up here beforehand. And that's that's no one's fault but my own. Uh, but you guys made me, you know, go out of my way and watch some of that tape because that game was, uh, that was ridiculous. Now, you won up yourself kind of in that regard this last weekend. Top 25 upset, number two, Fred Self Stadium. That's got to be rocking, man. Tell me about that environment and uh, this past week for Carson Newman. Yeah, I mean, we had around 5,000 fans there. Um, I mean, it was, it was rocking. It was awesome. Um I would say the crowd at a home game is such an advantage. Um, last year, we went to Newberry, bring back that. We went to eight overtimes with Newberry last year. And, I mean, their crowd was amazing. And it was like we were away, so it was like, oh, my gosh. Like, I can't believe we're playing in front of all these people. It's so loud. The band is right there on the field, basically. And it's insanely loud. So, then to come home, play LR who and beat them, who has been – like when we came into the sack, it was one of those names where it's like, like LR is the top tier. Like yep. you beat them, like you're in a whole nother level. And it was just like, so to come beat them and then go up against Carson Newman, who's ranked as well. And they have a brand new coach as well. Mm -hmm. Same DC as last year. So I had a little, I kind of knew what I was getting into with them. Um, but for a defense plan against a triple option that we haven't played against, uh, it was really hard for them but I mean with the yep. with the crowd being there being up being upbeat on third down and fourth down uh, when they're kicking the field goal I mean it was just it was a great atmosphere to be a part of and get the win 
that it seems like a rather important uh, piece of that as well, for sure. And we'll talk about that option and kind of what that entailed playing against that. And Carson Newman, obviously, with Coach Ingram, they have been off to a very hot start. And they, very similar to you guys, have come out and had to earn their respect. The difference, though, the main difference between the two of the programs, you guys very new to the scene when it comes to Division Two. Carson Newman having that history and kind of that tradition that comes with that program. Uh, nonetheless, both of you kind of bursting onto the scene. But you talked about, before we got going, you know, this for you guys being, year three really of division two football and really you guys didn't really complete that realignment process my understanding is until of july this year yeah. correct so yeah. from the ncaa standpoint you guys being a first year division two institution by the entire inclusivity of you know eligible for playoffs and all these other type of things that the d2 schools are a part of talk about the strides you've seen this program make just in your time there and going through that kind of realignment process yeah, so I was a part of the first recruiting class to um, to be a Division two athlete, mm -hmm. so to speak, uh, coming in. And so watching all of us stay together, I mean, if you look at our roster, it's the same guys that I came in with. We're all seniors now, basically redshirt juniors now. And it's we're all together. And we stayed together through it all. And, I mean, this is our first year having winning season, guaranteed, because um, we came off five and six, two years back to back. And it was like – Guys, we are so close to just getting over that mountain. We are so close. And we were young, and now we're just getting older and older and older. And it's like, look, the experience is helping us out. We're now competing with these teams. Like, let's let's go make a run for this. And um, so with it all, I mean, going back to spring ball, I would say Coach Q, which is our head coach now, he was just a receivers coach in spring ball. Then he got bumped up to offensive coordinator midway through spring ball. Then so now, I'd say a week before we came back to campus, we found out our head coach stepped away. So then Coach Q gets bumped up into the head coaching role. So within six months, he jumped up two job positions to be the head coach. And we all loved him as a receivers coach. I mean, everyone knew who he was. We all loved him. He was out there. He was hyped all the time. So we were like, we didn't know who was going to be the head coach. At first, it was like up in the air when we found out the news. And then we found out, like, I want to say – like a day later, we found out it was Coach Q, and then we were like, all right, like, let's go. Like, he's been here before. Like, he's never been a head coach, but he's been in the offense. He was the offensive coordinator a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. left to go to UVA Wise when we were D3, and then he came back this past, um, couple of years ago to be the receivers coach. So he knew he knows the offense. It's been That's the very same interesting. offense yeah. since him. So having him go to be the head coach, and now he's a play call, so he's still the offensive coordinator. And him play, uh, calling the plays, and then our DC left, and Coach Walters, who played for us, who played for Emory and Henry a couple of years ago, he moved up to the DC. And I mean, my goodness, man. Yeah, we've had a complete coaching change just in like a week of right before we came back for fall camp. That's and incredible. Yeah. So, I mean, with us, I would say with the recruiting class that I had my coming in my freshman year, and then the guys that are just added on to it that are big playmakers um, for us, I would say that we – I mean, we just knew that if we just stick together and just stick to the plan, it's going to be the same offense. It's going to be the same defense. We're going to be able to click, and we're just going to be able to keep going. And now there's multiple different stuff that's different, like offensively. Like he changed our reads on certain stuff and so on and so forth. And I'm of course, sure he's yeah. the same thing. Um, but – we just knew that if we stick to it, just stick to the plan and stick to what we we know that we're capable of doing, we knew we would come out this season on top. And, I mean, that's what we're we're still trying to achieve. And, I mean, each week is just another chance to get better. So Yeah, and you control your own destiny right now, which is the great part about it, where you guys are at. Some of the statement wins that you have under your belt, you're not out of the woods yet. You guys know that. But, you know, admittedly, I knew it's some piece, obviously, about the head coaching type position. But, man. I did not know some of the rest of that information. It feels like maybe the stars have aligned for this WAP squad. That is really, really neat, and I think really unique. You don't see that often in college football, and let's face it, when you do, usually it spells anything but success, which you guys have found a way to flip that around and uh, really use it to your advantage. But talking back to, to this weekend with Carson Newman, you had mentioned the option and maybe some of the challenges that pose for you guys defensively from an offensive standpoint. Does that change your mindset at all on the sideline, knowing that maybe there's 
some more looming pressure on every possession because you turn it over, you might be giving the defense, you know, you might be keeping them out there on the field for eight minutes as they kind of chew down and chew through the clock. Is there a little bit more of that pressure on every possession, knowing that uh, that might be one of the last times you get the ball in that quarter or that half? Yeah, so our key into this week was supposed to be we're just going to go and um, – Keep try to keep the time of possession on our side. Just okay. try and keep it like keep the plays moving. Just keep getting first downs. Don't get behind the sticks. Um, stuff like that. And we didn't really achieve that goal. I mean, we still came out on top. But I was going to say, I was, we're going to talk about it a little bit. Carson Newman, almost thirty-seven minutes of time of possession, yeah, and but, the fact that you and I are here talking about a win when you look at some of the breakdown of what they're able to do on yeah. the ground offensively. We're going to talk about that. It's crazy, man. Like, the fact that you guys were able, able to overcome that. Yeah, I mean, and I shout out our defense. I mean, our defense yep. is phenomenal. I mean. Two big takeaways through the air, right? Carson Newman, yeah. they drive down the field, and they just can't finish those drives. You guys get to pick up on those kind of sudden change type moments. Yeah, no, I mean, we were. And that was the – I mean, the best thing about it was is that we were able to st stick together even though when they went up 3-0 because I'll, I'll take that ownership. I fumbled the ball on the first drive yeah. out in space. And um, the DB made a great play, pulling my jersey in and punching the ball out. Besides yep. that, the defense, I mean, they came straight up to me and they were like, Charles, you're good. Charles, you're good. Like, we're going to get this right back for you. We're going to get it right back for you. Like, they're not going to get anywhere, so on and so forth. Now, they went, go up and kick the, the – they get three points, and then we go out. And at this point in the drive, we're, okay, they're like, all right, it's 3-0. Let's go score. And – at this point, we're just running the ball on them, which we figured out early on that we could run the ball really well on them. And side note, Cole Lambert, who played against the LR, who mainly played the game of LR, he uh, he came back from injury this past week. So it, they were like, all right, Charles, we're going to run you a little bit more because we do have an option within Cole if you do, like, if anything gets yep. messed up with you. So we plan to do quarterback runs. We plan to get Jordan Jackson the ball. And then just to get Cam Peoples and Tristan Stead and Jakari Moselle and Cam Abshire, we were like, yeah. if they're going to try and man us, we have we feel like we have the fastest receivers in the in the sack and that we can just blow past the DBs. And that's been our goal kind of almost all season is just get them the ball, get them get the ball deep to them, get them on the short posts and slants um, and so on and so forth. So going in, we knew that they were a big man team. But then they started showing a little bit of quarters and cover three. And so it kind of mixed us up offensively from what we were doing, but they weren't loading the box. We noticed yeah. that if we went out and we spread the guys out, they were putting one backer in the box and they were bringing up a walk up. So then we were like, okay, if we get Jordan blocking for Charles run for me running and um, that it would, it would open up more run lanes for me to get going and get more yards out of. And that's what we oh, kind yeah. of figured out early on, which was good because, Ended up leading to a touchdown, and then the defense, I mean, they are incredible. Got the turnover, and then one play later, Cam Peoples was sitting in the end zone by himself, and it was just like, okay, guys, we're here. Like, we yeah. just have to keep this rolling. No, and the confidence had to be, I mean, absolutely rolling for you guys. You go up 14-3 to three against a team running the option. One of the, the biggest downfalls of that is playing from behind. Right, that's yeah. not something those teams are typically built to do. We saw it with Harding against Watchtaw Baptist just uh, yeah. a week ago, when they had to try and pull off some fourth quarter heroics, and were just unable to because that's so outside of their typical scheme. Now, yeah. I'm sure they'll adapt and move forward and have a better plan in place when that happens next time. But you guys are up 14 to three. The defense is playing, you know, bend not break. Really, I think is the best yeah. way to kind of describe that. Obviously, conceding some big time chunk plays, but when it got down to the red zone, not allowing those scores, not allowing the Eagles to finish drives. The confidence level had to be at a pretty all-time high. You guys are up 14-3. to three. Talk about, you know, was that part of the conversation of like, okay, we just got to put the foot on the gas. Like, these guys are really going to struggle to come back from this kind of deficit. Yes, I mean, that was the biggest thing was that we, we wanted them to put the ball in the air. Yeah. We have, we have five guys in the secondary that we are so confident in that we'll just go get the interceptions. I think we're either one or two in interceptions in Division Two. Yep. And so with that, we're like – please put the ball in the air because our guys are going to go catch it. And it's, it's one of those things that we were like, look, if we can get up on them and get them passing the ball, we'll be, we'll be perfect. We'll be fine because we know our DBs are going to lock it down and then we'll get the ball back and just kind of milk the clock away and just get the game out and get, get the win and move on to Mars Hill. 
Um, so yeah, so I mean, we when we got that fourteen to three, we were like, all right, they have to start putting the ball in the air. Yeah, and which led to two two, which led to two interceptions, which was what. And we you guys did. are leading the country right now, by the way. Just to okay. you know, so you do know that you got nineteen right now through eight, yeah. which is. Holy shit, that is a ridiculous number. I also knew it was up there until I just fact-checked myself. I didn't know it was that number. Uh, yeah. That is ridiculous. Three of those returned for touchdowns. I mean, that defense has been playing at uh, an incredible clip, and that helps. That certainly helps in these ones. But the last one for you, Charles, is, is talking about, you know, it feels like some people in the polls maybe hadn't given you guys the respect coming into this, right? And I'm not going to make you, you know, put out some some uh, bullets and board type material, yeah. but you know, you hadn't been given that respect, and I'm sure the guys in that facility in that locker room felt like they had earned, especially with a big win over Lenore Ryan and some of these other statement wins inside of the SAC play. Now, they don't have a choice, right? They had to put you up there in the pool, and that's got to be a pretty special feeling. But what's the message been like around that facility to keep the chip on the guy's shoulder, even though now you're just starting to get a little bit of that recognition? Yeah, I mean, we still believe that we're not ranked because of the AFCA polls. but yep. um. Yep. I mean, D2 football came out there and said we're 23, which is, I mean, that's cool and all, but um, at this point, I mean, we're looking at the super region rankings. I mean, yep. that's, that's what we're looking for. We want, we want to get high up there in those numbers and go from there. I mean, we want to win out. Obviously every team wants to win out, but we feel like we have the best shot too. We feel like we have a great shot to go to be undefeated since limestone and which they have a great team. And so from there, it's just – we still have a chip on our shoulders because we believe that we're better than what they're giving us mm -hmm. no matter what. No matter what they say, they can give us two, and we're still like, no, we're better than that. And they give us Love one, that. we're like, no, we're Hell better yeah. than that. And it's it doesn't matter. It's we're, we're always looking for the next opportunity to beat somebody else, beat a ranked opponent. I mean – just to get uh, just to get higher up in the super rankings. I mean, we feel like as a team that we have a team that can go and compete with anybody. Now, there's other great teams out there in Division Two. I mean, there's unbelievable teams like Harding is. I mean, I watched them last year in the national championship um, against the Colorado School of Mines. I mean, I remember literally watching that. And I mean, they have a great team. I mean, the trip they run the triple option. They're pretty <laughs> dang good at it. Yep, but. Um, and Carson Newman's great at it. I mean, they have a Navy head coach, so well, O line coach from Navy came to Carson Newman. Yep. No, um, I trust me, I follow, I follow. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I get the message. And that's what you know, that's why you gotta, yeah. you gotta get your guys on is that you know, you guys have proven it now and and if they didn't believe before, shit, they believe now, right? You've you've yeah. got those statement wins and and you look at you guys are a part of that first list of the of the regional rankings with two of those head to head wins of two other names of those teams that we've talked about. So obviously a lot of uh, good stuff to come from you. Like I said at the beginning, my man, I hope I'm the first interview of many for, for you and this squad. And I'm hoping to continue to follow you guys uh, along this run, my friend. I appreciate you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Absolutely. Have a good rest of your night, man. Big thank you to Charles for joining the show. We're going to talk a little bit more about his Wasps here. And we talk about the regional rankings that have come out. Uh, and when I say regional rankings, you'll notice all of them just say NR next to them, uh, courtesy of D2Football.com. Thank you for putting these together. But um, this is kind of interesting because basically what they've done, the NCAA has taken what they believe is the top 10 teams in each region and just put them out here. Like, hey, if the playoffs were tomorrow, these are the teams that would be in consideration. Obviously, we know they only take seven from each super region, but these are kind of the teams on the cusp or in the hunt, if you will. There's a look at your super region number one. I'm not going to go through like the whole list, obviously, because that's just a lot of names to go over. There's a look at super region number one. Um, I think some of the bigger names here, obviously Kutztown right now, 8-0, just dominating the PSAC, set up with a, a PSAC championship game, most likely with Cal PA, um, who is also listed on here. California, you see them there, 7-1 and one right now. Some other big names that maybe could surprise some people. Slippery Rock's always going to be in the conversation. A Findlay team that is really catching its stride right now. Some other PSAC names, like East Stroudsburg in the mix. A Charleston team that is ground and pound right now behind Siobhan Wright, as we really good air attack right now too uh, over in West Virginia. Otherwise though this Ashland team, you don't know who's going to come out of the GMAC quite yet and Tiffin down there. In Super Region number two, Carson Newman was really hot until they ran into the buzzsaw that is the Wasps from Emory and Henry. Johnson C. Smith is 8-0 and finally getting some recognition that is well deserved. Lenore Ryan does have a blemish on the record but still playing some really good ball. You got a Valdosta State team that offensively is doing a lot of really good things. And uh, you know from there there's a lot of open pieces inside of Super Region number number two. 
here we go. Super region number three. Everyone knows, I think, the best of the best, right, inside of this super region. Central Oklahoma, they do pick up their first loss of the season, but it was against a very talented Pittsburgh State squad. The only team inside of Super Region 3 without a blemish on that record, Wachita Baptist 8-0 after that big upset win over Harding, who's also listed GVSU, Ferris State, Emporia State, some other big names in the GLIAC and MIAA right there. SVSU also listed here, interestingly enough, 6-2. and uh, Southern Arkansas squad, and finally, one piece of representation from the GLVC and U Indy. Finally, Super Region number four. Do have a couple of the Lone Star big time names showing up here in Western Oregon, Angelo State, those kind of squads, some RMAC teams like Mines and Pueblo and Mesa, um, Central Washington very much in the mix as well there. But we'll see how this kind of shakes up. The NSIC has been eating each other up all year long and kind of taking body blows at each of the teams. Western Colorado seems to be head and shoulders above the rest inside of the RMAC. So that would appear to be the favorite coming out of that conference. But that's a quick look there at some of the regional rankings. Let's get into talking about some of the highlights and some of the best games of the week. And I think I would be remiss if I started anywhere else than the Anchor Bone Classic. Ferris State goes into Allendale against GVSU and they put on an absolute clinic. I'm going to tell you why. But 34-7, the Bulldogs take this one, and a big part of it, you're going to see here, special teams for the Bulldogs. This is a big-time kick return that, if you were watching the game, you kind of understood Ferris was kind of dominating. Grand Valley, after the half, gets a much-needed touchdown. This is how Ferris State responds. A big-time kick return, bring it in for six. Trinidad Chambliss playing absolutely out of his mind in this one. And then they go back to the special teams play. Right here, blocked punt, recover the ball. The Bulldogs getting it done in all three facets of the game. Those were really two big plays for me. Another reach over here from Trinidad into the, the goal line for another Ferris State Bulldogs score. Two interceptions for the Bulldogs as well. I think you're going to see one of those right here. And quarterback... For the Grand Valley State Lakers, Avery Moore out of this one. Also, Iguabuke, I'm hopefully pronouncing that one somewhat correctly, but uh, I do know he's good at playing football, and I also know he was not available for this Grand Valley State squad. So they went on to their third-string quarterback, and Alex Dole, who we've seen play some meaningful snaps. But uh, in this one, unfortunately, that Ferris State front seven, that defense too much. GVSU losing their first and second-string quarterbacks proved to be fatal for that offense. And, um, I mean, this was, again... A 13-7 game in the beginning of the third quarter, really anyone's contest. A couple of those big-time special teams plays, some more scoring from Ferris, and those two big turnovers. This one busts open. Ferris State really making their mark on the top of the rankings. But we will move forward. Shout out to Flow Sports for those highlights. Into probably what was the next best game of the week. That would be over in the MIAA. Pittsburgh State taking on Central Oklahoma. And this one also... Very much lives up to the hype. Shout out to KOAM for this video here. The Gorillas, they do now stand alone atop the MIAA. Nobody without a loss inside of the conference right now. They beat Central Oklahoma 35-21 on the road in the all-whites lit state. Getting it done on the ground and through the air. The defense right now for the Gorillas is allowing only 18 points per game. That's second in the conference in sacks as well. First in the conference in forced fumbles. So this team is getting after the ball, getting after the quarterback, and also punching that thing loose, generating some turnovers defensively. Now, you look ahead now. This Pittsburgh State team playing UCM this week. Thought this might have been an MIAA championship implication type game at the beginning of the year, but... Uh, now it kind of seems like anything but. This UCM team certainly still going to put up a fight, an offense that has been catching their stride and still puts up a lot of points against a Pittsburgh State defense that does anything but that. But highlighting this performance for Pitt State, I mean, the offense really got things going. This touchdown here, a little trickery on the special team side of things, you always need one of those plays inside of some of these top 10 type matchups. They get it done on the road. Talk about a packed house down there in Edmond, Oklahoma. At least it looks like it. So that's pretty exciting stuff there for that squad. And again, still a lot of really good things going on. We had Jet Hoff on the show from that UCO Broncho attack. I really like what those guys are doing. Pittsburgh State opened this thing up. It was 21-7 at one point. Really got things going. Uh, Terrell Davis for UCO still had, I mean, he went out and got his. He does it every single week, week in and week out. The final stat line for him, nine catches, 119 yards, and two tuds. We'll take that. Madison Ridgeway, six catches, 127 yards through the air for UCO. And Jed Huff still had himself a day. 61 attempts throwing the ball. 
completed 29 of them, 386 yards, three touchdowns. When you throw the ball 61 times and you don't turn it over through the air once against a defense like Pitt State that is known to generate some of those kind of turnovers, feels like still a really good day. Obviously, he would you know, he would tell me that he wants the win, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. Let's go over to the RMAC, though. Western Colorado seems to be the team coming out of the RMAC when it's all said and done they take on Colorado School of Mines and come out victorious 38-28 on the road. They beat the Ore Diggers, and Mines had a 19-game winning streak at home heading into Saturday. That was ruined by this uh, Mountaineer squad. I got a couple pictures from the game here, at least, if nothing else. You can see it right here. Getting after the quarterback was a big part of this one, and I don't think the score is very indicative of what this game actually entailed. Mountaineers led this one 31 to 7 going into the fourth quarter. Mine scores 27 points in the fourth quarter, but not enough. Not enough. I was 27 or 20, 21. I'm, I've got a one or the other, but an explosive fourth quarter. 21, excuse me. 21 points in the fourth quarter, uh, but not enough for this uh, Colorado Mine squad. A little bit too little, too late. Western 8 0. They got CSU Pueblo this weekend coming into town. And, uh, you know, a lot of big things happening for this Mountaineer squad. The defense, I think, is probably the highlight here. I mean, the offense put up 38 points against mine, so I certainly shouldn't maybe say that. But um, the defense, I think, is, is certainly the highlight of this Western squad when you watch them play. They've got a, a big-time home matchup against what is now the number 10 team in the country in Pueblo. And... I would imagine that's probably the RMAC championship on the line this coming week. So we'll be definitely following along with that one. Let's move over, quickly talk about this Carson Newman at Emory and Henry score. Emory and Henry talked about it earlier with their quarterback. They take this one 17-10. to They defeat the triple option and the Eagles in a big-time performance. And i got to show you this, uh, this opening score here to get things going for the Wasps. Here it is, up the middle. Get things going. Uh, Carson Newman. Previously undefeated up to this point, the Wasps 7-1 and for the first time since 2014, a decade ago. Holy sleeper pick right now. This Wasps team is on fire. The offense is clicking on all cylinders. The defense, Ben, did not break, generate some big-time turnovers. They are leading the Mountain Division of the SAC, also leading the country in interceptions like we talked about earlier on in the episode. Carson Newman, that ran for 316 yards with the four turnovers, a couple through the air, a couple on the ground. That cost the Eagles the game in this one. A couple big-time plays like this. How about that? Wide open, back corner of the end zone. Score it. Time of possession, we talked about it earlier, 36 minutes, 23 in favor of Carson Newman. They win almost every metric, but that turnover battle, I think, was the one that really put them away in this one. So that Emory and Henry team, going to be one to continue watching down the road. Let's move over to the PSAC. We've got the Coal Bowl between IUP and California, Pennsylvania. This one could not be decided in regulation. We had an overtime game on our hands this weekend. Take a look at the, some of the tape here as we roll through this. How about this long pass down the sideline to open up the scoring here in this one early on for Cal? And they really wouldn't look back in this one, a quick score to start things off. They go into halftime up 7 nothing. And when you look here, IUP, it took them a long time to respond in this one. They would, but it would take them until about two and a half minutes left in the game to score their first touchdown. They actually gave them the lead 10-7 to into overtime, though. A field goal would uh, cost it, really, I guess, for IUP. They had the field goal. They convert in overtime. But Cal was able to punch it in in the overtime and get the win for the Vulcans and a statement win and kind of a rivalry type game for this Cal PA squad. And this was the touchdown I mentioned earlier on that first and only score in regulation for this IUP squad. But uh, this Cal team now is slated to really have a great shot at this PSAC title game, which I'm assuming they'll be taking on that Kutztown squad. If they continue to take care of business the way they are for Cal, a lot of different contributors on the ground. For this Vulcans team, Davis Black under center, 13 for 20, 142 and a touchdown. Not anything too crazy. He was sacked four times in the day as well. But defensively for Cal, stepping up was Rashawn Murray with a big interception through the air. John Hutchinson was in the backfield for a couple TFLs and uh, a couple other big contributors. That's the uh, overtime field goal from IUP. Shortly thereafter, the Vulcans punch it in for the touchdown and the dub.
with a very appropriate celebration like there. You like that? I can only imagine that's what he's saying. At least I would. But Vulcan storm the field, take care of business, keep things moving at an undefeated 8-0 and right now. And oh no, I cut away before the trophy. What am I doing? The actual Cobalt Trophy. Wait, you guys got to see this thing. Check this out. It's not the most glamorous looking trophy in college athletics, but damn, after an overtime thriller, it looks pretty good to me. The boys are loving it. Love to see that uh, down there in Pennsylvania. But we'll move down south even further. Number 24, Delta State at unranked North Greenville. Talk about another overtime game. This one, a lot more high scoring. Let's roll the tape on this guy and see exactly what we've got going on. Delta State, the Statesmen open up the scoring in this one on this long touchdown pass on the left sideline. That would be the opening score of the game from uh, Kurt Cole to Nino LeMay and a 46-yarder to get things going. That would not be the last explosive play, though. Right here, Jacob Walker, 56 yards to the house for this Trailblazer Trailblazer squad. Excuse me. Tie things up at 7. And that's really how the rest of this first half at least would go between these two teams. They were tied up at 7, tied up at 14. Then North Greenville starts to inch ahead, 28-14. All things would get tied up, but not until the fourth quarter. Kirk Cole would tie this thing up in the fourth quarter with 12 seconds left for the Statesman, which is a really ridiculous number. How about this wide open pass, too, to even things up at 14? Um, that's Jalen Green on the 65-yard pass from Kurt Cole. I'm going to fast-forward this one for you guys a little bit because you'll see why in just a second. I want to see when Delta State evens this thing up right here. This is the score that would do it. Cole drops back, comes up, makes it happen with his feet. Spin move, b but a little bit of a truck stick over the goal line, 12 seconds left. Delta State ties things up at 34 apiece with the PAT pending after this one. So now, 34-34 with almost no time left. This is the game, the play, excuse me, that would ultimately decide it. Fourth overtime into the end zone. You heard me correct. Fourth overtime. This one went all the way to four. The score right there, the two-point conversion was a big piece of that. They got to do it on the other end of things, the tipped ball out of bounds. That would seal the deal for the Trailblazers. Delta State unable to convert in the fourth OT. North Greenville takes the 47-45 to win over a Statesman team that's been up and down this year. But nonetheless, the only statement this Saturday was for the Trailblazers. That felt like one I definitely needed to highlight. Uh, moving forward. One more big one to highlight here. Uh, I want to talk about this August Stana Minnesota State contest. Augie taking the win 34 to 16 over Mankato, and in a couple big time performances. And this one, I think the one that's maybe most worth highlighting: Jared Eppardson, 15 carries, 72 yards, two touchdowns. He has broken quite a few records over there for that Augie offense, and is a guy that is one of the more multifaceted backs inside of the NSIC, and I think even in the country. Gunnar Hensley under center for Augie, 24 for 34, 263, and two touchdowns. Seems like a pretty good day. Minnesota State had some really solid performances. Did have a takeaway through the air. Joey Go Joey Gottel, hopefully pronouncing that one correctly, had a pick. Return that one 49 yards. You like to see that. Uh, but at the end of the day, Augie, too much. And you look at this Augustana team right now, what they got going on, 6-2 and two with one loss to the number one team in the country in FCS at the time in South Dakota State, the other one coming to MSU Moorhead. They still control their own destiny in the NSIC. Very much similar to uh, MIAA in that all these teams really have losses. There's not a lot of unblemished teams left in this conference. They got Concordia St. Paul, Sioux Falls, and at Bemidji State to close out their season. So we'll see how this Augustana Vikings team can close out 2024. But... Ooh. Let me take a breath. Quick hitters now for D2. In any 10 news, assumption, they beat New Haven 1914. There's now a four way tie at the top of the NE10. That seems kind of noteworthy. Assumption taking down New Haven. New Haven, the Chargers have been kind of the top dog in that conference for a while, with Assumption always kind of nipping at the heels there. But that's a big statement win, a low scoring affair. Kutztown, they dominate Shepard 24 to nothing. They're on top of the PSAC East. They lead the conference in scoring defense. Here's the stat of the day for you. Kutztown Bears, the Golden Bears, have only allowed seven touchdowns through eight games. That is incredible. In MIAA news, Emporia State, they close off a win over Nebraska. Kearney, 42-35, off the back of a ridiculous 
ridiculous performance by Tyler Common. And uh, we'll definitely highlight him. You'll see him on the graphic for the player of the week that goes out. Harding, they bounce back after a tough loss. They win over Southern Arkansas 49-17. How about Texas A&M Kingsville knocking off Western Oregon 21-14. The Wolves previously undefeated in Lone Star play, and they had not lost to a Division II team throughout the entire course of the season. The Javelinas take them down a notch. Ashland in the GMAC, they win a defensive battle over Northwood 9-7. Northwood's only score was a pick six, so Ashland's defense just about perfect on the day over there in the GMAC. But that's all from D2. We are going to switch over to our second guest conversation of the day, and we'll wrap things up with D3 and NAI football. Also joining the show tonight, under center for Evangel University, the Valor just took down top 25 friends, much in part to this man, slinging the rock, it's quarterback, Reed Potts. What's up? What's up? How's it going? Dude, excited to get you on here and uh, have some representation from the Valor down there. Uh, admittedly, we had talked about you guys and Evangel a couple times on the show. Did not know that was uh, the mascot, I guess, or kind of the the namesake for you guys down there. The Valor? Yep, the Valor. That's it. We got a, a horse logo, so yeah. Okay, that is badass. Um, if you oh, would have yeah. told me Valor, I don't know if my mind immediately goes to horse, but uh, it's yeah. sick. It's sick nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we accept it. It's, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's it's kinda, good. It's a more recent, more recent name, but yeah, we like okay. it. Okay, fair enough, man. And uh, speaking of of more recent, this past weekend, some more recent success for you guys, and it came down to the final seconds. It was not uh, necessarily off of your hand that this one eventually came down to. You guys got the job done, though. Talk me through those final seconds on the sidelines, seeing that kick go through the uprights. Oh man, it was awesome. We all linked arms. And uh, the snap, our, our long snapper, uh, Caleb Higginbottom's a stud. He normally doesn't have any issues at all, but it was just a tiny bit high. And our, uh, our holder, Dawson Mock, just did a great job getting it down. And uh, our kicker did a great job of kind of getting it up in the air because the, the front line, they kind of jumped and the ball just went right over their hands. So it was just perfect execution on their part. Need it. You need all yeah. of those different pieces of oh, that, yeah. uh, that unit, right, to uh, – yeah to be working at 100%, and as soon as one of them dips below, the rest suffer. It's such a unique little yeah. balance that they have uh, going over there in the ST room. Oh, yeah. But, you know, that they obviously did their job. But to get them set up in that position in the first place very much was in your guys' hands. You drive down in 10 plays during the fourth quarter. You scored with under two minutes to go. And then mm -hmm. the defense, they get a pick, correct? And then you've got yep. a chance to win it all in this turn of events just in the last couple minutes of the game. Talk me through those moments, those last couple of minutes had to just be wild back and forth for you guys. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty wild. I went over to the sideline right before, and I just asked uh, my coach, like, what yard line do you need me at? Uh, yep. Just for, just for field goal range. And so we were, we were running some plays, and uh, we kind of – we had an incomplete on a screen play, and then we got, um, we got to a third and five. And we ran a little play action where two of the guys ran out with the with the fullback, and I was kind of able to cut it up and slide with maybe I don't remember how much time was left. We got under center, ran a play, and then uh, and the coach was saying, "Roll it, like let's let's run it again." And so so I kind of I got under center, and then I looked up, and it was like five seconds, and I was yeah. like, "Nope, nope, we're not doing it." Because we I did a bad job of kind of getting up there slow I hear you and I think he wanted it snapped a little earlier so so once it hit like five or four seconds I was like I'm not snapping this ball we gotta call timeout <laughs> and called the timeout and got the kick out unit or the uh, field goal unit out there yeah so. that would have been that would have been some shit you yeah roll it go ahead and get the snap yeah. off and then the game clock expires yeah. and everyone's looking around like what the hell did we just do yeah yeah, but, yeah. Uh, he said it he said it was probably like 13 seconds and I just think yeah. there was some miscommunication or something that kind of took me. It happens, man. There's that. so much yeah. going on, yeah. right? There's so much yeah. going on all around you. And then you're trying to get the ref the ball, first of all, because that's usually kind yeah. of the, you know, the chick in the chain there that is like the tough last piece. Like, get, put the ball down already. Like, spot the ball so we can get yeah. going. And, uh, you know, a lot going on. I don't, I don't doubt that at all. But, uh, the game plan and the scout going into this week mm -hmm. with the Falcons, obviously, from a defensive standpoint, what they pose offensively is tough. And in that that mm -hmm. dominant ground game in the auction, what they're able to do with Cavante there uh, under center for them. Offensively, what was the scout like for this friend squad? Really, the main thing was was no turnovers because we didn't know how many possessions we would have with a triple option team like that. Yep. You know, like the clock just – the, like so, the last the week before we had sixteen or seventeen offensive possessions. This week we had seven. Oh so my we gosh. knew that every every drive was crucial, 
Um, their defense is very chaotic. They try to cause a lot of chaos. They kind of have like that three high safety look. They'll roll people certain ways. Okay. And then on certain down and distance, their D-line and their linebackers will be like, we call it radar, where they're just kind of running at five yards. And then some will come, some will drop. So it was really just trying to just be present one play at a time, don't make mistakes, and just be calm in their chaos pretty much. I like that. I like that a lot. Be calm in their case because that's what they're trying to do, right? It's yeah. a lot of stuff. It's eye candy for you under center. Yeah. It's eye candy, and you have all these guys moving around, and it makes potentially a quarterback of less stature might go out yeah. there and panic and make a throw that he's not supposed to, or uh, tempt them into a certain hole shot, or try and make something happen, or force a throw into a tight window. But uh, you guys obviously yeah. able to do uh, some really good things offensively. And speaking of that, what should people know? You know, outside of the the sphere down there about this Evangel offense, some of the weapons you guys have down there in Missouri, man. Man, we got a, we got a lot of pieces on offense that I'm very blessed to have around me. They they get to they make me look way better than I am most of the time. So Good we got, answer. We got a uh, we got Brock Lyle. He's a returner, um, stud receiver. He was out this last week um, with a concussion, but then we got. Rafe Darter was a new guy that we added in at receiver. He's a tall, athletic, big guy that had that made a lot of big plays. Our running back room is awesome. Eric Williams and and uh, we got Cam and Jay Hart. They're all very good at just toting the rock, and they just wear oh, yeah. on a defense. They're big guys. And then uh, this last game, we had a tight end, Brady Allen. He's a true freshman that kind of took off for us this week. So that was awesome. That is awesome. That's pretty cool. I didn't realize that. I guess looking at the looking at the box score, I don't know if I if I looked at that. But now you guys seven and zero with some statement wins under your belt this weekend, notably being one of the top of that list. But certainly not out of the woods, right? Uh, before we got going, I mentioned you know McPherson this weekend. That is going to be yep. an absolute dogfight. Pun one hundred percent intended. There seven and one. They come into town. You've got a Southwestern team that's trying to sneak into the top twenty five, kind of on the outside looking in and then you close things off with a tough Bethel squad to finish out the yeah. year in short how do you get it done my man man I'm just focused on one one day at a time just watching as much film as I can just getting up to the facility and breaking them down uh McPherson's a good squad they got a lot of good athletes their D line's big they got athletic linebackers and really solid in their DB room it looks like so we just gotta good, do a good job of just executing on offense and kind of get the game plan together this week textbook textbook yeah. my friend um but you know speaking about you i guess more specifically this is not your first stop when it comes to playing college ball but you always stuck around missouri and from your experience at a couple different d1 stops how does the kcac competition stack up are there some areas where obviously i'm sure there's some spots where there's a pretty large gap in some of that thing mm -hmm. and some of those you know kind of deals position wise or in some of the scheme are there some other areas though where the gap is a little bit smaller than you might have imagined yeah i would say one thing really is like what I wasn't expecting is the game is still just very fast at the college level. Like, like I was scout team quarterback for SEMO and Missouri state, and it was very fast going up against those guys. And then I come here and it's like the speeds pretty similar. I mean, you might have four, three guys and we have four, 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 five guys, but I mean, yep. the speed's very similar, the scheme and all that's very similar. So it's not a huge difference. Um, just executing wise, it's just a little bit of size and speed. Of course. And I think a lot of people talk about the trenches and I think that's uh, kind of a big yeah. piece of that. Have you, have you noticed some of that? And I mean, obviously you're going to have dudes that can still ball out inside of there, but instead of being mm -hmm. uh, six, seven, three twenty, they might not have that exact stature to make the same kind of play. Yeah. 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 I have noticed that a little bit, just the size of offense alignment and defense alignment. I'm very lucky to have a pretty big offensive line. They're Hell yeah. absolutely awesome. They're, all returners they're very smart actually so our, our right guard is not a returner he's a true freshman but he's very okay. lucky to have he's got a center that is a stud returner and a right tackle that's an older veteran guy so he's always he's in a good in spot. Right spot yeah mm -hmm. he's just kind of that scrappy dude that just even if he doesn't do i mean he's normally he does the right stuff but even if he doesn't i mean he's knocking someone yeah. He's awesome. Yeah. That's when all else fails, knock somebody on the ground or run really hard and try and do just that. And then, uh, Absolutely. you know, you come down to break in film the next day and, and you're not really going to get reprimanded too much for, uh, yeah. for going to land somebody out, but, uh, oh, yeah. excited Valor Bulldogs this weekend. I'm excited to continue to follow along with you guys. Thank you so much for spending some time with me tonight. Man. That's all I got for you. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it. It was fun. Absolutely. Have a good night, man. Yep. All right, here we go. Let's talk about some D three football. Myself, joined by who else? Jimmy Martin. What's going on, man? 
Oh, man. A lot of good games to recap. From last week. We do so, have some oh. good ones, and and per oh. usual, the wax at the top of our list. I mean, what else could you expect? Yeah, you know, you, know, it, it, you got to cover the best football. You do, and and right now, the best football is certainly being played uh, right there. Let's start with this Platteville team, man. They improve to six and one, three and one in the conference, seventeen to ten win over Whitewater at home. I mean, time and time again, we just see Platteville's defense continue to step up. Um, and on another note. Uh, this is the first week since 2017 that Whitewater has not been ranked. Wow. Pretty wild stat. I'd, I'd like to share the audience there. But uh, and also with that, it's like Whitewater seems to have their playoff hopes vanish after that one. It's just so tough to have those losses that are already have built up. And it's just really hard to build a playoff resume when you have that many losses already. Mm-hmm. Um, even, even with the expanded playoffs, it'll be really tough. Being that the WIAC has six teams in the top 28 already. Um but, uh, yeah, Platteville takes home the George Christ Memorial Trophy. Uh, another great performance. Michael Premi had a bomb to Brant Stair. Uh, there. It's just, oh, man, that kid can move. Yeah, Brant Stair, now friend of the show on D1R. He yeah. is a stud. And yeah. um, I think you led with it. The Platteville defense for this Pioneer squad has been – the talking point, I think, for them for a long time. Even last year, that defense was playing at an incredible clip. I think the difference this year is this offensive production. That right there is the bomb you speak of. I got to make sure I'll get you the, the screen share so you can see that too. But um, the bomb right there to stare on the sideline was a big one. He had a few of those throughout the game and uh, a really a, a kind of a career day for Brant Stair. Seven catches, 163 yards, two touchdowns for him. He was all over this Whitewater defense. But yeah, I think for me, this Pioneer squad has had the defense that has been really stingy at times and kind of helping to control that time of possession. But when you have an offense that can retain some of these long drives, keep the defense off the field and keep them fresh, that for me is the difference with this uh, uw Platteville squad this year, Jim. Yeah, like, like, like we said before, like the best offense – the best defense and the best offense is great defense. They're good offense. So you know that the whole vice versa thing goes. Mm-hmm. 100%. Now, Platteville didn't have a ton of success on the ground. I mean, you look 27 attempts for 64 yards across uh, across the board here for this Pioneer squad, and that really wasn't the name of their game in this one, but still able to generate 300 yards through the air. Had a couple big uh, special teams plays, I do believe. Some good defensive efforts. Did have a takeaway through the air. Uh, Elijah Krantz had an interception there, and then had a couple other guys that were getting into the backfield. Not a single sack for this Platteville defense, though. I haven't really come to expect yeah, no, that. I, no, definitely not. I mean, obviously, you're going you're gonna to expect a little less pressure on the quarterback without Blazic, but, I mean, their defense has still been great. I didn't know they didn't have a sack. I did not – didn't see that. But, yeah, that's an interesting stat for sure. No, it's just one of those, you know, kind of those those weird ones that obviously didn't look like it maybe affected the game uh, that much. But, uh, you know, their offense got the job done. Defense did the same. This is a big-time win, and uh, that Whitewater stat that you uh, that you let off with is kind of ridiculous. I did not know that heading into this one. What is uh, what is the future for this Warhawk team? I mean, they're still Whitewater. I mean, they still got a great great program. They just fell off a little bit, man. It's, it's a shame to see. And they're such a great program. They're just not winning. You know, it's just it's kind of shitty. But it is what it is. I mean, they'll be they'll come back strong. I mean, again. The season's not over. Like theoretically, if they win out, they give themselves a chance. But you think so? Yeah. It's just, it's just a lot harder. Yeah. Yes. No. One hundred percent. I'm looking at I'm looking at Stout too. It's like we have to. We probably have to win out the game as well because we lost Carroll. Obviously, that was kind of a crappy loss for us. But uh, it is what it is. You just gotta win. You just gotta win football games. No, I'm with you there, and uh, it's tough when the WAC is just cannibalizing each other right now. You talked about having all those teams uh, ranked in the top 25. I don't believe there's any of them without a loss now, right? River no, Falls gets taken down single, by lacrosse. There's not a single undefeated team, no. Yep, and we'll talk about that game here in just a second, but I think that's going to be kind of uh, an interesting point moving forward is that there aren't a single one of these uh, WAC teams without a blemish on their record. And so moving forward, that's the interesting part of the playoffs. And we can move forward through this uh, this WAC slate. We'll talk about a team that uh, had their perfect record. I believe it was a perfect record. Put a blemish on that one. UW Lacrosse at home against UW River Falls. The Eagles take this one at 28-24. This is a statement win for a lacrosse team that uh, was picked to win the league this year and kind of had some some early troubles not handling some of those conference foes but have bounced back in a big way, Jim. No, yeah, certainly. I, mean, I thought it was super interesting going to this game, being that lacrosse was uh, ranked at 25. They were actually the favorite on the Hanson ratings in this game by just okay. a half point, which I thought was uh, kind of interesting. You know, you think upset from the lower ranking, but being at home and everything, 
they're technically favored, but I was still surprised to see them come out with the victory. Nonetheless, uh, Gabe Lynch doing his best beast mode impression. Yes. Spectacular touchdown run right through the heart of the River Falls defense, who's been quite good. And they just, uh, just one play, just, it just totally makes your defense look like you can't tackle. But obviously, River Falls is really, really good. They just won. Wild touchdown play by Gabe Winch there. But uh, lacrosse looks to be turning a corner after dropping three uh, pretty early on in the year. But they head up north this week to take on uh, the Blue Devils. So that should be a really interesting one for them. So. Mm-hmm. And obviously, mm-hmm. River Falls is still very much alive in the playoff race. But, you know, you don't, I don't think they have to win out, but you'd think that they want to themselves, you know. But they've already played, like, a really tough part of their schedule. But um, they're still going to have a lot of tough games coming up here. And they can't look past any vote. They will, and there's that Lynch run that you talked about, man. He was uh, he was a workhorse throughout the entire day. 38 carries, the bell cow for the Eagles, finishes with 229 yards, and that one touchdown there, the 42-yarder. That was uh, that's a hell of a day against a tough uh, defense. I mean, when you're touching the rock 38 times, the yeah. body just to endure that kind of uh, physical anguish throughout the course of a game, that's impressive in and of itself, right? And talk about a River Falls squad, too, that is uh, – there's a big takeaway through the air uh, right there for the Eagles as well. But a River Falls squad that is still without Blaha, right? And that's – you know, that's going to be the piece that we come back to a lot throughout the course of the season. And uh, Warzinski gets the majority of the reps under center for them. Did have the one interception you saw right there, but also threw a touchdown. 21 of 31, 241 yards through the air. That's a really respectable stat. That line, you see it though at the end, the Eagles celebrating this one at home. We've been to that environment. We've known what that's like. Yeah, Roger Herring Stadium, sweet man. It's a great, great place to play football. As far as moving forward for uh, this Eagles squad, if we take a look at their schedule in the coming weeks, right now, four and three, and you know, really on the outside looking in, their last three games, of course, at Stout this coming week, which I'm sure you're gearing up for, been back at home for a home stand against Whitewater and then Stevens Point. And in that second to last week of the year, Lacrosse, Whitewater, I'm sure preseason we would have identified that as one that would have probably had some WIAC title implications. Now it kind of seems like that will be anything but. Yeah, I mean, at, at this point, it's more of like a – Whitewater playing spoiler for lacrosse's playoff chances. You know, obviously, if they lose this week, they're done. But, um, you know, if they manage to get a victory up here, they'll have a very good chance to do to still get in. But, you know, they got, still got Whitewater to take down, too. But you know, they, got a, they got a lot on their plate this weekend. So They certainly do. We'll move over and uh, finally get out of the whack and talk some, some other ball on the D3 slate. How about uh, number 12, Wartburg, going on the road? At number 21, Co College. This one, a defensive back and forth battle. The Knights, though, they prevail 14 to 7, pick up the win. And this is a, a Warburg team. We've seen their defense on the national stage do some pretty incredible things. It was the offense that got going first, though. And, uh, you know, no points in the first half across the board in this one. 14 7, Warburg takes it, though. Yeah, I got some pretty cool stats for you, Cody, because I know I kind of blew your mind with the Whitewater stat. So this was this Dick's team straight. Uh, conference opponent, uh, Warburg, has held under 100 yards rushing. Wow. And it's also their 23rd consecutive conference victory. That is big time. That's big time so, stats right there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they, uh, they've, been, they've been playing really, really good football. And obviously you see that. Like When you stop a run, you make an offense one-dimensional, it's going to do a lot for a team. Yeah, when you watch some of these clips right here, I think that last one, a great example, kind of, uh, I don't know if you call it like a jet sweep, but some kind of outside run. The way their defensive backs come up and fill on the outside and set the edge and set the tone, I guess, more importantly, is something that you don't see a lot of defenses or defensive backs, I guess, in general do at this level. The Gohawks really struggled. They got stretched out in the run game, and I think you'll probably see more of it as we get through the film. But this defensive secondary for the Warburg, I know the conversation last year centered around Grover and that uh, linebacker core, which rightfully so and they, they were playing at an incredible clip but now I think the other areas of this Warburg defense are starting to get the shine that maybe they deserve and maybe they hadn't gotten talked about nearly as much in the past no yeah I mean it's always you got to give those guys recognition for sure for sure you had a, a kick here in the first that was no good and uh, from there it was literally a grudge match just back and forth and here's another great example quarterback gets strung out on the outside made a play right behind the line of scrimmage uh, Warburg if I go up and look at the plays, I believe had quite a few 
TFLs on the day. And uh, I'd be correct in in saying that about seven or eight TFLs on the day for this uh, night's defense. A couple of those being sacks, a couple PBUs. Uh, the turnover department, maybe they struggled there a little bit more in trying to generate a few of those. Wartburg's offense really did struggle to get a whole lot going on. And, you know, Split reps under center for this Wartburg team. You had Leo Dodd and Carter Markham, uh, 6 of 9 and 6 of 11 under center, respectfully. But the rushing attack was very spread out for this Wartburg team. They had 40 carries on the day as a squad. Yeah, they're going to pound the rock, man. Wartburg goes to pound the rock and play really good defense. That's their identity. So. And we did see right there a big-time play for Coe that ended up uh, getting called back. So it felt like at every turn along the way, there could have been a potential game-breaking type play, and it was either called back or for some other reason just didn't happen. But uh, Warburg does start to put together a drive here in the third quarter and would finally get some points on the board. I mean, this would have been... If you're not a fan of uh, defensive football, this would have been a very tough game to watch. But they do finally get something going here almost across the end zone. A little bit of that leak out and then right on the goal line, punch it in for the first score. And that really would have uh, almost been enough. Coe does score in the fourth quarter. And this Cohawk team is one that I think a lot of people are demanding maybe gets more respect. But, uh, you know, that's going to be a, a tough setback for them moving forward. But for this Wartburg team, they're 6-1. and one. Right now, Jimmy, their one loss is the St. John's. If you, if you saw those MPI rankings come out, they are currently on top of the list, for better or worse, using the analytics, St. John's is number one. That is the one loss on the year. They've got some statement wins against teams like Central College, and uh, now this last week, obviously, against a ranked opponent in Coe College. And you move forward <laughs> the last three weeks of the year, Luther, Dubuque, and uh, Loris. And, again... No shot on any of those teams. I don't see Wartburg losing uh, throughout the rest of the year. And that means inside of the American Rivers Conference, they're going to most likely finish out on top, which we both know means an automatic bid. Yes. And I would be in agreement with you in regard to their next three opponents. I think they will have no problem winning those games. Yeah. 16th straight ARC opponent, though, that they've held under wow. 100 yards. That's, that's insane. That's even, I think that's even crazier than winning 23 games in a row. Holding 16 straight conference opponents under 100 yards rushing. That's like that's just I mean, a that, commitment that kind of to that, right? To winning games, obviously, but like it's still ridiculous. Uh, yep, 100. Um, percent Let's move over. Talk about some other games quickly. Not um, any tape to roll with these buns. How about North Central Augustana? The North Central squad, man, they continue to just go on this roll. 49 to 10, they roll up on the road and really get things going. And this game was actually 7 to 7 at one point. Augustana evens it up in the first quarter. From there, it was uh it was all cards, man. They this game was 49-7, a late field goal. I don't know what they were going for there. Uh but this this North Central team was I think very advantageous and really just taking advantage of other teams' mistakes. When you look at their some of the numbers offensively for this team, they only had four more first downs than Augustana, even though they beat them by 39 points. That was a stat that stood out to me. North Central, two of nine on third down, one of two on fourth down. And you're going through this, and you're like, they won by 39? Yeah, they must have been scoring a lot on first down or something. I don't Certainly, and a big part of it. On third down. That's yeah, cool. a big part of it is the turnover battle. They forced the fumble and recovered it. Had two interceptions. Interceptions, excuse me, through the air. And we look at the time of possession. Augustana thirty six minutes to twenty three twenty four of North Central. And when you possess the ball for thirty six minutes and only have ten points to show for it, that's an oddball. That, that's a really oddball type of game. Yeah, that's an outlier. Absolutely. But North Central continues to dominate. NPI maybe doesn't think uh, think so as much as some of the some of the voters. But uh, hmm. I digress. We'll keep moving forward. How about uh, Salisbury? Number I believe number six right now, and at least the uh, I think it's the AFCA poll. Forty two thirty five. They escape a scare from Rowan in a game that uh, maybe snuck up on them just a little bit here. And they jump out to a thirteen nothing lead, but Rowan bounces back, take it takes the lead of their own inside of the second quarter. Going into halftime, Rowan would lead 21-13. The second half, though, Salisbury would come out and finish things off. But it took until, I mean, quite literally the final seconds of this one. It was a, excuse me, Michael Cox run with 17 seconds left in the fourth quarter. That would propel them ahead and give them the 42-35 win. And we've talked a bit about this team, and I'll have to pull up their schedule. Have you followed along with that squad all this year? I know I haven't really been super tuned in. 
Yeah, we we covered them a few games like early in the season like when they played Johns Hopkins. I want to say we covered them, but um, I'd have to double check. I know they've been having a really good year though. Yeah, you look at the Seagulls, they're 7-0, and and the game that you're talking about was their win over Johns Hopkins um, that I know we had talked about on the show. And those back-to-back wins for them over Muhlenberg and Johns Hopkins, number 18 and number 8, respectively, they've got some statement wins, both out-of-conference wins, might I add, for this Seagull team. And when you move forward, they uh, eke their way out of that one against Rowan. You've got uh, TCNJ. I'm sorry, I have no idea. I wish I could tell you what uh, what squad that is. That's a new one for me inside of the NJAC. Um, but then you got McDaniel, the Green Terror, and then uh, Keen to close out the year of final conference game. So you're talking about most likely another bid here for this uh, this Seagull squad who currently sits undefeated, and there's a really good chance they could finish out that way. But uh, another squad I want to talk about, out west a little bit, Whitworth. They keep their undefeated season alive or specific. 39-32, definitely a bit of a close contest. And uh, this Whitworth team, I think, when you go back to last year, was a team that uh, some people didn't love the fact, uh, automatic bid-wise, they made their way to the playoffs. But they surprised some people. And I think this year that has certainly carried over. I'm going to pull up their schedule just so I am like talking 100% educated. But I know they have a big one in conference against Linfield. That'll be their big test towards the end of the year. Yeah, Linfield's always tough. That'll be a really, really, really good game. I think we will cover that one. Yeah, so right That's now, uh, some of the statement wins for this Whitworth squad. They're 7-0, and like I had mentioned before, undefeated. They opened a year with a dominant performance against Gustavus. And then a big one, I think, that is definitely worth noting, how about a 31-19 win over Eastern Oregon in Week 2? That feels like, looking back and looking at the year that uh, EOU's having, feels like a really good win. And now going down the list, you got Lewis and Clark, George Fox, and then Linfield is actually their last game of the season, the final game in NWC play. And that should be, if everything lines up the way I'm assuming it will, that game will most likely be a game for an automatic bid and a trip into the national playoff. Yeah, seems like it. I think that's a pretty good assumption right there. Yeah, Linfield right now, um, forgive me, I don't know off the top of the, off the top of the head, I'm pulling up there schedule as well but I know they've had a good year and they've been blowing opponents out by a very large margin I certainly have followed along with that six and one right now is this Linfield squad their one loss at Wisconsin Oshkosh and out of conference loss they are not only undefeated inside of conference play right now I would love to do the math on this right now they have allowed 34 points in four games of conference play which seems really good one of those being 72 to nothing and uh, they're they're absolutely rolling. I don't see them having uh, too much trouble heading into that Whitworth contest. The offense is playing at a really good clip right now, but uh, we'll, we'll see, man. We'll see. That'll that'll definitely be uh, the case for an automatic bid. Finally, Augsburg, they outlast St. Olaf in overtime, 35-34. I think those were the big ones that I wanted to make mention of. Are there any other ones? I know you wanted to talk about uh, maybe the stout performance a little bit. Yeah, the old war on I-94. I know, yeah, the, uh, the Blue Devils came out victorious. Eau Claire played really, really well. Their offense looked great. Um, Harry Rubidoux had a heck of a game for those guys, throwing for 398, the Blue Gold. So, shout out to Harry on his good performance. But, uh, man, oh, man, those Blue Devils. And Adam Moen with five passing touchdowns. And uh, my boy, Pat Corcoran, three catches, 131 yards, three touchdowns. I mean, Efficiency. You can't play much better than that. We actually, uh, the star, the stout bar school guys, shout out to those guys, by the way. They cropped Pat's face onto like the Randy Moss Thanksgiving meme where he like turns around and like, <laughs> it's just like a picture of him like smiling. Oh man, it was so good. Was That's so awesome. Good. Yeah. That's I awesome. I posted on my Instagram story too. I don't know if you saw that, but it was, oh, it's just a great. I think I did. I think I did. Um, and now, obviously, a big one for you guys this week, dude. I mean, you guys in a similar spot. I mean, you're like really. You look at some of these teams. Did we think lacrosse was going to have three losses heading into this point in the year? Absolutely not. But now you look at it like you're. It's got to feel like you guys are pretty level with a lot of these squads right now. You're not too far behind. Not at all. Yeah. We are. Uh, we're really confident in uh, what we got here, and we're looking forward to it. I know Coach Yagi really wants to have this one because, you know, he's a UWL alum. Yep. So uh, this is a big one for him, too. Oh, yeah. Sweet, man. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for joining me tonight, Jim. Always. Back to close it off, Matt Schwarzler, NAIA. We'll start things off in the G-Pack. Familiar territory for you, my friend. Where are we, where are we getting going here? Yeah, so uh, I, I should say I am repping today. Uh, unfortunately, my guys did not get it done against Northwestern, but that's a good squad, so that's okay. Uh, shout out to Dakota Wesleyan, 
always got to give my boys their flowers. Hell yeah. Uh, they're, they're holding it down over there in Mitchell. Um, but yeah, we got uh, boarding side, eighth ranked boarding side traveling to Dort. Uh, fourth ranked Dort looked like the better team going into this game, but morning side came out absolutely swinging. Uh, punched Dort in the mouth a little bit, which I don't think they were prepared for. Morningside, just for a good chunk of this game, looked like the better team, but in the second half, Dort kind of starts to piece it together, but it's just a matter of being too little too late. Uh, Morningside reestablishes themselves as the top dog in the G pack. They are 7 0 alone at the top of the conference, and uh, they play Northwestern, who's tied for second with Dort next week. Yep. Um, in what is going to be an absolutely banger matchup that game has national championship implications from what we've seen in years past. Um, a lot of these teams not in the same form as to what we've seen, but Morningside is still very good. So uh, a, a good win to get under their belts, and they're gonna they're gonna pass up Dort in the rankings for this week after that win. That they are as they should, and this one was. I mean, you talk about a game that. Really, I mean, the score doesn't even tell maybe a little bit of that. You kind of talk about Dort coming in back into that one late. 28-7 to in this, and Morningside going along at a, at a really good clip. And a couple of the reasons Dort was able to do that, had an interception you saw there on the tape down in the red zone that was able to deny a score from the Mustangs later on. But um, still a lot of really good positives for this uh, Dort squad. I don't have their schedule up in front of me. I have to pull that up as we keep going. But you mentioned it um, right now, 7-0. In the G Pack, Morningside, that Northwestern game. What's like the preliminary kind of examination or scouting report on that one? Yeah, it's it's hard to tell because Northwestern is much weaker than they've been the past couple seasons. Sure, um, I would definitely uh, give Morningside the edge in that one, but it is in uh, it is in hostile territory for them. So, I. Uh, or no, sorry, it's in it's in Sioux City. So Morningside is hosting. So yes, they definitely have the advantage. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> yep, uh, looks like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean this this Dort team right now they're slated to to take on Northwestern not the coming week but uh, November 9th. So they still have that on their schedule along with uh, Briarcliff and Waldorf. But uh, that was their first loss inside a GPAC play. You mentioned it. Uh, some pretty big statement wins already for them. They've handled a lot of the teams. They haven't really had any crazy close matchups, even like a good Concordia squad we've seen give some other teams some trouble. So uh, Dort squad definitely still not out of it. You talk about taking care of business against teams like Briarcliff, Waldorf, but then if you can pull off that win against Northwestern at home for this Dort defender squad, um, still a lot of things to be excited about for them moving forward. But we'll move over and talk about one of our two Game of the Week selections when it comes to NAIA. This one being number 20, Evangel, at number 19, Friends University. We had Reed Potts on earlier in the show, Matt. We talked about with this one. But uh, tell me what your kind of examination of this one was. Yeah, uh, just pure grit and determination from this Evangel team. Uh, obviously, being shut out in the first half is never a great look, but they absolutely blew the doors off of the game. Uh, in the second half, obviously, uh, Reed Potts, who, like you mentioned, was on the show earlier, had something to say about that with yes, uh, 283 yards and a touchdown to his name. Not to mention Eric Williams on the ground having a touchdown through 61 yards rushing. And uh, some good reception performances across the board. The defense really is what stepped up for this Evangel team also in the, the second half because not only was the offense getting back in rhythm, but the defense shut down the friends, uh, the triple option that gives so many teams so yes. much trouble. That they did in that defensive effort. I mean, to highlight that, obviously, Nate Swafford, he's named the NAI National Defensive Player of the Week how about six tackles to start things off? He blocks a field goal, returns a fumble for a touchdown, and intercepted a pass on Friends' yeah. final drive of the game, which I talked about with Reed. They go down to score with less than two minutes left, and they get an interception. It's like, holy shit, not only did we tie this up, they had kind of assumed maybe that this game was going into overtime. Now we have a chance to actually finish it right here, right now. That was thanks to uh, Mr. Swafford back there in the defensive backfield. That is uh, Evangel's that just... 19th consecutive yeah. win dating back to 2022. It's wild, isn't it? They just, they're creeping up again, like they did last year, win after win, and they're slowly making their way up there. I think they're 15 or 16 in the pool this week, and uh, the media pool has them like top 10. Yep. Um, very good team, man. They're super solid. 
And I've been super high on this friend squad uh, this entire season. So them pulling off a win on the road against friends, like that is a huge statement to make. Um, and not to mention that they are also in control of their, uh, their auto bid. They do have to take care of McPherson, uh, which we will talk about a little bit later. It's McPherson. Uh, I've been saying McPherson for too long. Yeah. Mc, Mc, McPherson, McPherson. I think it's just more depending on your, your, uh, your, your geographical area, your maybe enunciation. Yeah. yeah. Fair, so. fair. But McPherson, McPherson, they are playing damn good ball. The Bulldogs are, yes. I know that much. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. A very sneaky uh, one lost team right now mm -hmm. that not a lot of people are still talking about. And they, um, after their game last week against Bethany, Kansas, I guess I can mention that now they did blow them out 59 to seven. Yeah. They will play Evangel friends in Southwestern college to close out the season. All top 25 teams at the moment. Yeah. Uh, all could be statement wins and McPherson could end up with an auto bid if they went out or even win two out of three of those games. So they are, they're in prime position and uh, the battle for that side of the KCAC is going to be super interesting. Yes, it is. I mean, that division alone, right? I mean, you look at all yeah. those teams that you just listed. Evangel is very much in the same boat with uh, McPherson right there mm -hmm. um, with uh, Southwestern and Bethel to close out the year. And Bethel not having the Threshers not having maybe the year that uh, they would have expected maybe in the past. Um, still sitting at 4-4, four and four, but right now inside of the division 0-2 oh after a couple tough losses. But this side of uh, the KCAC right now, like you said, there, there's very much is still a race. And with the way that Friends game played out, I mean – Evangel is the only team without a blemish on the record, but McPherson, Friends, and Southwestern, all one-loss teams, all sitting at 7-1. and one. You do not see that very often, man. That side of the, the KCAC is stacked. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's cool to see. Uh, the Kessinger is definitely the elite division in the KCAC this year. The the Bissell kind of has its own thing going on. Like uh, <laughs> Kansas Wesleyan and uh, Tabber College are tied at the top of that division yes. right now at uh, – Ford four overall, so uh, and I believe Tabber was the one to get the win potentially over McPherson. I have to go back and check, but yeah, it's uh, they're they're definitely a decent squad, but it is it's definitely they got some different things going on in the in the Bissell compared to the, the Kessinger division that they do. We'll go out so. west to the uh, the frontier, Carroll mm -hmm. at number 12, College of Idaho, and of course, in this one, maybe does not go the way that uh, an outside eye might have expected. Yeah, uh, Carroll very much handling a very solid College of Idaho team. Carroll just kind of stacking up wins quietly while the rest of the frontier was eating itself alive. Clearly paid off. They are sitting alone at the top of the frontier at 5-0, and which is crazy to not have a single conference loss in the frontier. We mention it every week. This division is an absolute nightmare. Mm -hmm. But next week, there is some room for chaos because after this win, they will play second place Southern Oregon, uh, which will be a top 20, very intriguing matchup. Uh, but yeah, this was just Carroll from start to finish looking very good all the way through. Um, obviously, College of Idaho would be able to punch back, but I think Carroll in the um, – like the second quarter and the third quarter, like that middle portion of the game really just dominated. Yeah, third quarter, 21 points, four takeaways through the air for yep. this Carroll squad against the Yotes. And uh, you are not going to win a game when you have four turnovers simply just through the air. Uh, that's insane. Carroll finishes with 461 yards through the air. And uh, that feels a really good number. They didn't have a ton going on the ground, finished with 518 yards of total offense, though, which, again, in any game is certainly <laughs> going to uh, is going to feel pretty good. Um, otherwise, trying to think of some stuff that stands out here, 8 of 14 on third down is definitely a good mark. Did have uh, 4 of 5 inside of the red zone as far as scoring chances mm -hmm. and uh, won the time of possession battle. Talk about the turnover battle. They won just about every kind of metric that you can study in this situation. Yeah, uh, and not to mention, like, Jack Perka alone, 23 completions for 461 yards and yeah. five touchdowns, Just only one yeah. take on the day, long of 93. And he was throwing that to uh, Chris Ackleskin. Hell yeah. I definitely butchered that. Uh, apologies. Uh, shout out Corey on the NAIF ball because he says it every week, and he doesn't mess it up, but I do. Yeah. Um, 23 of 29, receptions. he almost had as many touchdowns as he had in completions. Yeah. Uh, just absolutely insane. And uh, Chris Ackleskin, uh, 
yeah. five catches, 223 yards, two touchdowns with a long of 93. My God, talk about an aerial assault. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what was going down in Montana. I didn't know there was an Air Force base there. But, uh, <laughs> I guess that has that has changed thanks to the Saints of Carroll College. That's good. I like that, dude. I like that. We'll uh, we'll move over. Let's talk um, another one of our game of the week selections. This one. Uh, a little bit maybe of a different reason as far as the the criteria for the game of the week selection. Not that these teams aren't uh, great teams in their own right. St. Francis, uh, in, in Illinois, or Indiana, excuse me, and uh, number, uh, number 18, Marion, who has played some really good ball this year. The namesake alone, not what made this one the game of the week, but the actual play itself and kind of the pacing of this game. Marion up 21 to nothing. St. Francis able to stage a massive comeback in this one. Take the win 31-28 on this last-minute field goal. And they get the job done. What a win for this uh, Cougar squad. Big guy touchdown. Oh, my God. Yes, this play, this play is ridiculous. <laughs> so 55 good. just waltzes into the end zone. I got to get his, I don't so, his name. But. Yeah, dude, it's so good. But, man, what a big win for St. Francis Indiana, who has also quietly had a very solid 6-2 and two season. Not yeah. to mention that them and their other St. Francis counterpart in Illinois uh, are sitting alone or tied. I guess they are alone together. Is that a thing? Um, those two sit atop at 2-0 and in the mid-states, mid-east. So, uh, <laughs> no, Midwest. Damn it! I always get you were so close. <laughs> yeah, it's so close. Uh, it's the mid, it's the mid states, mid east, mid east, and Midwest. So it's a lot to like <laughs> to to keep it in there. But yeah, the Midwest, um, they're tied at the top, and Marion, for the first time in a while, is uh, not ranked. Also, uh, third in their division, which is very rare for them. They are usually top two at the very least. Um, Marion and Saint Xavier will play. For, with both of them being unranked for the first time in a very long time coming up. Yep. So that's going to be very strange. Uh, Marion essentially has knocked themselves out of contention for an auto bid unless they went out and both St. Francis's stumble along the way. I believe that uh, uh, Marion has to play the other St. Francis as well along the way. Mm -hmm. So they could get a leg up. That being the one um, in Illinois. Yep. Yep. So it'll, it's a tough road for them they can find a way to claim an auto bid. It'll be very unlikely though. So uh rarefied error for this Marion team after that game. Yeah. And a note on the, the guy under center for this St. Francis squad being the one in Indiana, Josh Kolka, who I've had the chance to play and to see play in person. That being because he used to be at Wayne state, the Wayne state in, at Detroit, Michigan started all 10 games for the warriors in 2022 and in 2023, did not see, I mean, nearly as much time. Only appeared in two games in the Warriors' schedule in 2023. Which, for me, seeing this guy play, the dude is a baller. He obviously has exemplified that at the NAI level now. And I was kind of dumbfounded, admittedly, when he was not playing meaningful snaps for that Wayne State team because I'd seen him play through high school and then into the college level. He's got a kind of prototypical quarterback frame, 6'2", 210. That was um, even a couple years ago. I had to see at the updated roster. But a big frame on this guy. He's got big arm talent, able to move around, make plays with his legs outside of the pocket, even gets it to the big guys every once in a while like we saw. Um, I personally am <laughs> just glad to see that uh, he found a landing spot here with this Cougar squad because talk about being underutilized and as yeah. you know, his previous spot and now finding a home with this uh, – with this Cougar team that, you know, you look at them now, 6-2, and two, but uh, those two losses, the first one to open up the year was at Indiana Wesleyan, and the second one against a really quality Taylor team. So they still have their work cut out for them. St. Francis, Illinois, St. Xavier, and then Olivet Nazarene, who just pulled off a massive win this week, still on the docket for this Cougar squad. But I wanted to shout him out because I know um, I've seen him play ball. Glad to continue to see him playing some meaningful football. Yeah, absolutely. It's always good to see those bounce back guys find their spot. And it's uh, it's always a little ed extra bonus when it's in the NAI because it kind of feels like the Wild West sometimes. So It does. <laughs> it feels like a, a neat little rebound spot for a, for yeah, a quality yeah. D2 guy, right? For sure. For sure. Um, but we'll move forward. Some of the quick hitters here. And uh, I'll, let, I'll let you run me through these ones, Matt. Yeah, for sure. Uh, kicking things off with uh, number 25, Cumberland of Tennessee beating – 
not to be confused with the University of the Cumberlands. Which, by the way, is incredibly freaking confusing, and I cannot stand that that exists. Uh, So they had the Cumberland Bowl. Uh, I don't think that's the official name, but that's what we're calling it for obvious reasons. Uh, Cumberland, Tennessee, uh, 49 to 25 victory to get a leg up in the Mid-South, which uh, the Mid-South is in a weird spot right now, too, because in the preseason, we talked about Georgetown, Lindsey Wilson, and Bethel being the big three. And uh, Bethel's sitting second to last right now. Uh, Lindsey Wilson is in third and Georgetown is in first with an undefeated record, but they are five and two overall this Cumberland Tennessee team while in the middle of the fold could still find a way to get some quality wins for the rest of the season and uh, getting the win over their Cumberland's uh, counterpart is, is a big step towards that. So they're putting themselves in a good position with that one. Hell yeah. Yeah. Love to hear it. Love to hear it. Yeah. The Cumberland Cumberland's is, I just go back to that. I, and the fact that they're like it's, constantly playing each other too. Imagine being a commentator yeah. for that matchup. Well, it's they're so used to it. It, it they hardly think about true, it, right? Because they're so used to that differentiating thing. It's like, oh, it's just the S, and then one is uh, University <laughs> of and the different other states, one. I guess, at least. Yeah, and their their color schemes are different enough. Like if you if you get used to the name, like I feel like the rest kind of falls in place. But yeah, look, I'm not from Tennessee or Kentucky, so it is confusing even to me still. So, I hear you, my friend. Yeah. Oh, we got what else we got on here? Uh, fifteenth ranked Montana Tech dominating Rocky Mountain to climb in the front tier. They still damn right have a uh, long way to go to get back to the top, but they are solidly in the the, the middle. They are in fifth place. Okay. Uh, so they are in that two loss category with College of Idaho and Eastern Oregon, which isn't terrible uh competition to be with but you still have to find a way to pass up montana western southern oregon and carol who are all playing really good football right now um and they are number 13 as they move up after there you go just posted about an hour ago lucky 13 over there in butte yeah there you go um so obviously montana tech still climbing the rankings but in terms of getting an auto bid they still have a have a ways to go and a team that we have not talked about for a few weeks because we thought they they fell off, but they did not fell off. They are actually <laughs> back, as the uh, as the guys say. Uh, Concordia of Ann Arbor, two win zero, tied with Indiana Wesleyan at the top of the Mid States Mid East after getting a a big win and a nine to zero victory against Siena Heights. Uh, yes, that is a field goal in the first, second, and third quarter to clinch a victory. Obviously, um, yeah, totally. <laughs> as uh, football is God intended, as I like to say. Um, <laughs> and look, man, you can you can call it an ugly win all you want. This Concordia defense came to play. Siena Heights, while not racking up many wins, is also known for their solid defensive play. Um, they've been good the past few years, and Concordia has rattled off some wins in a row, and they are back to 500. And if they get a win over Indiana Wesleyan, they are in sole possession of an auto bid. That's definitely a big if, and they got a, a tall a task if. to climb there. If. But I, I don't care. The West League team's very good. Yeah, but there is a path. Yeah, and you know I don't care who you're playing. 145 yards of total offense, limiting a team to that uh, at any level of football, right? That's that's a recipe yeah. for success, even if you yourself don't have you know too much more from that. But a Concordia team that is is fighting. For literally everything, because they know that they're done after uh, after this season. That's uh, that's cool to see them still in the mix. Absolutely, it's it's fun to see, and I I really do hope they claw their way back. I think they can do it. They're playing really good football lately, so uh, should be interesting to see how that goes for them. And uh, like we mentioned before, my last note here is uh, on McPherson. We mentioned the situation in the KCAC right now. It's all sorts of uh, whacked out, but man, McPherson cannot sing their praises enough they look fantastic in that kessinger division there could be a legitimate case for like an auto bid and then one or two at large teams like that's how good they are right now yeah okay (laughs) no i get that we already talked at length about this i mean this kcac and they still like many teams right now i think still towards the second half of the season in this at least in this division in this conference still control their own destiny so that's got to be a good note for them yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's nice to be in control 
Also, shout out uh, McPherson for having a Slim Chicken sponsor. I love that place. Still, <laughs> uh, there was what one is that, Falls. dude? It's like a it's like a drive through chicken place. They had one in Sioux Falls. So when I was going to school, in that Mitchell, is dope. Anytime you go to the airport, because that's where the airport is in Sioux Falls, you go get Slim Chickens. It's delicious. That's awesome, dude. Got a little promo. Let's get them on here, huh? Dude, let's get a. We slip. can sell the hell out of that. Can I just get like some deals on food? And all <laughs> That's all we need like for a, little, a shout out, little, dude. <laughs> or like some coupons or something. I bet they don't deliver to Marquette. Probably not. No, oh, chicken would get be there cold. By boat or by uh, by like <laughs> by freighter. Like, by freighter, yeah. By you freighter. Can, like smuggle yourself on a yeah. freighter boat. Yeah, no, you should see, dude. We got the the ore dock up here. We they bring in <laughs> these massive ships full of iron ore. <laughs> Hell yeah! And that they're really—they're not bringing. I shouldn't say they're bringing in the iron ore. Yeah. They're coming to get it, right? Yes. So, so empty freighter coming in. I'm just saying there's an opportunity for a lot of chicken on that boat. I like where your head's at with this. I think we need yeah. to workshop it a bit more. I'm going to go we're... eat as soon as I hit end recording. All right. Well, <laughs> I, now I am too. So thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate you, man. Have a good rest yeah. of your night. Take it easy, man.